Turn to Acts chapter 2. That's where we're going to be this morning. I want to kind of catch you up to speed because we're kind of, we're, we're kind of parachuting in to Acts chapter 2. We've been doing um, books of the Bible kind of over the last few months, and we just finished up the book of James last Sunday. Um, but at this, at this point in the life of our church, just really felt a stirring um, to go to the book of Acts. I've been reading through the Bible uh, this year, and as I read through the book of Acts, I just felt, wow, we need to hear this as Summit Church and the life of our church and what we're walking into right now, what we're walking through right now. These things are very important in the life of our church. And I actually, um, again, I don't, I don't do this uh, often. In fact, I'm not sure I've ever done this, but I preached this message um, back in June at Johnny and Friends and uh, one morning. And, and just as I, as I got done, I was walking to breakfast. Um, and, and you know how everything's better when you smell bacon? Right? And so I finished preaching this message and started walking to, to breakfast. And just the, 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 the aroma of bacon hit me and this message hit me. And I said, someone needs to hear this. Someone needs to hear this message. So we don't have the bacon smell for you this morning, but we have the message. And so it's adapted a little bit because obviously when you're preaching to a group of ministry leaders and missionaries, it's a little bit different. Um, but this is, this is just for us this morning. So let me catch you up into what's happening in the book of Acts. Jesus was crucified. Um, he was buried, rose three days later, spent about 40 days with his closest friends. And then we pick up in Acts chapter 1 where he is going to ascend into heaven. Now, this wasn't shocking to anyone because this was the message that Jesus had been preaching all, all through his life, all through his ministry, that he was going to go and prepare a place for people. John 14, if it weren't so, why would he have told us so? Which he was giving a bunch of comfort to his closest followers. Hey, there's a lot that's about to go down. Right? There's a lot that's about to go down. You're not going to understand it all. It's not going to all make sense to you. But just be comforted because it's all part of the plan. It's all part of the plan. Okay? And, uh, and, so, and so he was preparing them all for this moment. And then the ascension into heaven. And he just you know, disappears into the clouds. He ascends into heaven. The angels look at the disciples and all of those that were standing around at this time. All of Jesus' followers. And said, why are you still gazing into heaven? He's given you a mission to do. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and behold, I'm with you always, even to the ends of the age. What I love about the, that's called the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. It's actually written four times in the scriptures, three in the gospels and one in Acts, Acts 1, 8. You'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and gives you power, right? And so we see it four times. And what I love about the Great Commission, what we're talking about there, go and make disciples of all nations, is that is the mission of the church, in fact, one of the things I like to say often is that the church doesn't have a mission. God's mission has a church. The reality that there are people without a relationship with Jesus that Jesus died for, right, that he wants to save. Right? And that's the mission of the church. The mission of the church well, let's, let's keep going, right? Let's keep going. And so then, so then uh, uh, they, replace, um, they replace the disciple at the end of Acts 1. Acts 2, the first part of Acts 2, the Holy Spirit comes. In fact, let me read you Acts 2, verses, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. What a beautiful picture. They, being all the believers, all of the Jesus followers at that time, they were all together in one place. I love that. I love that. And, uh, and, and so uh, the Holy Spirit came um, and, and filled them, right? Just as Jesus promised, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you'll receive power and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Then Peter preaches uh, Acts 14 through 41 uh, is, is his message. And then we pick up in Acts 2.42. And this is where I want to spend our time this morning. Acts 2.42 uh, through 47. This is where I want to spend our time this morning. Let's read it together. You guys ready? You guys good? All right. It's not hot in here. That's just your imagination. 
Okay, if I can wear jeans in here, you're okay. You're okay. All right? Uh, I, need, I need to, never mind, never mind. I need to get one of those sweat rags so I can pull out of my, you know, just damp myself. Right? That, that's, how, that's how you really know you're preaching. All right, Acts 2.42. And they devoted themselves. Now, this is the same day. Okay? The same day, the followers of Jesus, the Lord added to their number 3,000 souls right before. Great revival. Wouldn't that be awesome? Can you imagine? And they, the church, the early church, the, the mission, right? God's mission to save the world, God's plan to save the world. The church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, there's four things that the early church devoted themselves to uh, right there in verse 42. We're going to unpack those in just a few minutes, but let's try to get through the rest of this. And awe. Everybody say awe. awe. Y'all got to wake up now. Okay? That, that hurt a lot from this side of the room. Y'all are awake. Y'all had your Roma Joes this morning. This side of the room, let's go. Wake up. Okay? And awe came upon every soul. Every soul. Every soul. I love that they say every here. That Dr. Luke, who is the author of Acts, reports that awe came upon every soul. No one was exempt from the power of God in the early assembly. Isn't that awesome? Because today, like we just demonstrated, and y'all didn't even know it, right? Today, we've got some that come into church, and we talked about it last Sunday, God will meet you at the level of your expectation, and they're just excited, and they're ready to be here, and the pastor says, everybody say, aw, and this group of people, aw, and this group of people is like, you're not entertaining, you're, uh, you're not entertaining enough yet. <laughs> come on now. You're going to have to step your game up to keep me awake, right? And awe came upon every soul. Everybody was bought in. Everybody was engaged. All came upon every soul. Okay, we'll tell more about that in just a minute. Okay? And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, this is where we lose some people, right? Okay, awkward. Wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Okay, miracles were still happening. Jesus has ascended into heaven, but miracles were still happening. How can this be? Jesus said it would happen. Right? Jesus said it would happen. He said, everything I'm doing, you're going to do. You're going to have the power to do even greater things through the power of the Holy Spirit are you going to be able to do than me. And so Jesus, Jesus told them this was coming. And so, and so the church of 2022, listen, 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 listen. We can't mysticize. We can't, we, can't, we can't make the power of the Holy Spirit this weird thing that's untouchable. The only thing that we're trying to get across here when we talk about wonders and signs of the church is that God is still as active today as he was 2,000 years ago. And we've got to believe that. If we want to accomplish the things of faith that Dylan was just talking about before we sang How He Loves, if we want to accomplish the things of faith, we've got to believe that God can indeed do it. Wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, verse 44, and all who believed were together, there it is again, and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together. I love that, day by day. We should write a song called Day by Day. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day. There it is again. Those who were being saved. So there's some things that we see here consistently in the beginning of Acts. They were together. Right? They were together. Things were happening. Things were happening in their midst. Excitement was happening. Passion was stirring. Life change was among them. And it was beautiful. They had things in common. Now, 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 now. 
we, 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 we've got to address this for just a moment. That doesn't mean that we all have to like the same music. Okay? We've got some Gaither fans in here. Right? We've got some, we've got some country music fans in here. Ian is not that. Right? We've got, we've got some... Um, uh, move on. Right? We've got some different tastes in here. Right? We've got some different tastes in here. But, but what, what, what it meant when the early church had all things in common, it meant that they had all things in common regarding the mission. It meant that they had all things in common regarding the mission. What was the mission? The day by day. The day by day that we see. The 3,000 souls that were added to their number. The, the day by day, those that were being saved. That was what the early church had in common. That all of the things that they were doing, all of the things that they were giving their life to, were contributing to the church growing and hell shrinking. Day by day, the Lord added to their number. Okay, so let's back up. Y'all good? All right. All right, Dylan, we're going to ease into it. Where's Dylan? Oh, he stepped out. Okay. All right. And they, go back to verse 42, Acts 2, 42, and they devoted themselves. Now, before we unpack this and we look at the four things that, uh, that the church did together, before we unpack this, I want to look at this word devoted. And the, and the, and the oh, look at you. Oh, it's about to get fun in here. Woo! You didn't blow your nose in this, did you? <laughs> Before you brought this up to me. That'd be funny. How to punk your pastor. All right. All right. Let's talk about devoted, okay? The true definition of what it means to, to be devoted is this. It's defined as being, as, as, as being very loving and loyal, very loving and loyal, okay? Um, it, it, it means, as Scripture says earlier, letting your yes be yes and your no be no. It means, it means sticking to commitments, right? Um, like, like I would say, I would say, I would say that, that our culture has a, new, um, has a new definition of devoted, okay? It's, it's everything ish, or might, right? Like you make an appointment with somebody for lunch or, or breakfast or something like that, and, and, and you make an appointment, there's, there's a, depending on who it is, and I'm not saying this as a blanket for everybody, I know some of you are very committed and you're, and you're on time and, and all of those things, but there's, there's a 50-50 shot that they'll actually be at breakfast, right? And most of that depends on whether or not, and, and don't find this, don't take this offensive, this is just the reality, and, and we all kind of do this to each other for the most part, it depends on whether or not there's a better offer. Right? Like, like you invite somebody to Dunkin' Donuts, okay, we're going to go to coffee tomorrow morning at Dunkin' Donuts. Somebody else comes and says, hey, I want to take you and buy your breakfast at Blue Pig tomorrow morning at 7.15. I'm now conflicted. Right? I'm now conflicted. Some, some, some of you are laughing. Some of you are shaking your head in disappointment. I understand. Okay? I understand. Right? But our yes these days doesn't always mean yes anymore. And our no doesn't always mean no anymore. In fact, some of us could use the word no a little bit more in our lives, and maybe we would be able to say and stick to our yeses a little bit better. Not that I'm preaching to myself this morning, but come on. They were devoted. They were loyal. They gave themselves to the early church. They gave themselves to this thing. They gave themselves. They committed themselves. They, and it meant, it meant, I'm sure, that they sacrificed some things. Like they sacrificed comfort. And this time, post, post-resurrection, to be associated with Jesus could have gone either way. I mean, Jesus had just been crucified. 
And now they're going to go and make much of him. And they're going to carry the mantle and the torch. And so they were sacrificing some comforts. So my question for you is this morning, what does it mean to you to be devoted to something? What does it mean to you to be devoted to something? How do you come devoted? What are you devoted to? And so see, the, 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 the rub here, as Pastor Rick would say, that be the rub, the rub here is this, that there are so many things at our fingertips now to be devoted to. And they're all good things. Most of them are feel good things. There are already so many things at our fingertips to be devoted to, to take our energy, to take our time, to take our effort, to take our, our, our finances, our treasures, right? There are so many things in front of us at our fingertips to be devoted to. The question that we don't consider enough when it comes to what we devote our lives to is this. You ready? What am I called to be devoted to? What has God positioned me specifically to be devoted to? You want an easy one for me? My wife. It's a good idea for me to be devoted to my wife, is it not? Some of you are nodding like, duh. <laughs> because if I'm not devoted to my wife, kids, family, right? I am the only husband for Kristen. Therefore, I need to devote myself to her as her husband. I am the only daddy in Bria, Micah, Ezra, Vera. Is that it? <laughs> Did I get that right? Right? Thanks, Ken. The thumbs up. Right? And so, and so therefore, I should be devoted. In the same way, in the same way, I am the, I, you are the only church that I pastor. Right? There are, there are some, there are some pastors of, of some smaller churches and they, and they carry two congregations at the same time. You may, you may have heard of some of those. Right? And I look at that and I'm like, wow, that is so impressive. I couldn't imagine shepherding, pastoring two congregations at the same time. Because I'm so devoted to you, right? I'm so devoted to you. And so what does it look like to be devoted for you? And, and, and so sometimes we could simplify the things that we're devoted to by thinking, is there someone else that could do this job? Is there someone else that could fill this role? Or has God placed this in front of me for such a time as this to accomplish this? And so, and so the question we have to ask before we devote ourselves to things is, has God called me to devote myself to this? Has God called me to devote myself to this? And so specifically this morning, we're looking at the church. The question that we ask in our membership class, for those of you that have taken it, you might remember, for those of you that haven't taken it, here's the question that we ask in our membership class. Has God called me to belong, and in that belong, we're talking about devotion to Summit Church. Has God called me to belong to Summit Church? Because that commitment, that devotion means some things, doesn't it? Means some things. I mean, how, what would it look like, what would it look like if I were to um, go to Applebee's this afternoon uh, and eat lunch. Applebee's on a date night. Oreo. What would it look like if I were to go eat at Applebee's and to walk up and say, hey, y'all have got that song. Y'all are doing well. Obviously, you're expanding. There's more franchises coming up. Um, you know, Applebee's, I can just, I can tell, does not need my money. But Ruby Tuesdays, they're shutting down everywhere. And so, thank you for the food, Applebee's, the boneless wings, honey barbecue, right? Thank you for the food, but I'm going to go pay Ruby Tuesdays. 
I'm going to go give them my finances. How do you think that's going to go with the Applebee's manager? Not well. Right? Not well. Because my devotion, I have eaten, I have reaped the benefits from Applebee's, but I'm devoting myself elsewhere. Right? I am putting my, I'm putting my resources elsewhere, clearly, with my checkbook. Right? And we do that with time. Again, we do that with energy. We do that with treasure and resources all the time. Right? Where we benefit from something, but we, you know, we devote ourselves elsewhere. And we're so scattered that a lot of times we don't even realize it. We can't keep it all straight. And so we've got to wrestle with this devotion thing. What are the things I'm devoted to? And am I called to be devoted to these things? Y'all with me? Y'all with me? Okay. This, this, this section is now awake and I've lost y'all. Okay, it must be the fan. All right, so let's look at what they're devoted to. Number one, number one, we see they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching. Now, I want you to notice something here. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, not the apostles' interpretation, but the apostles' teaching. It is important at the church for you to make sure, for you to make sure that we are not tickling ears, but that we are preaching the Word of God. Because here's the deal. If we stay consistent to the Word of God and He's in control, then He is going to keep us in, our, in His hand and take care of us. Now, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that, that checks are going to show up in the mail and that we're going to never have issues. Because he promises that too. I mean, we just talked about it in James chapter 1. Rejoice when you encounter trials of various kinds, for the testing of your faith produces endurance. So some at church will go through times of testing, but if we stay committed to the Word of God as our foundation, He will keep us in our hand and He will protect us. And that's true for our corporate life, and that's true for our individual life. And if we stay grounded and founded in the Word of God, He promises to take care of us. Because, and, I, and I'm not going to, because there are, there are groups, there are people that take the Word of God and change it. Don't they? There are people that take the message of the Gospel of Jesus and water it down and filter it and, and make it something that it was never intended to be. And that's scary. There's one in particular now that causes me to cringe. There's a, there's a teaching out there today that is encouraging families to not serve or be engaged in the church outside of Sunday morning. And there's a group of people that are going around and they're doing conferences and these family things and, and get your family back in eight weeks. If someone ever puts a timeline on something like that and, and, and a gimmick like that, run for the love. Because it's going to take a lot more than eight weeks to... Anyway, anyway, that's the soapbox. Okay, let me get off the box. All right? But there's this teaching going around that, 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 that you're... Get your family back by just attending church on Sunday morning. Don't serve. Don't, don't attend a small group. Don't be in community. And, here, and here's the truth of God's Word. You can't do life alone. Dad, you can't do life alone. Mom, our kids need champions within the church that are sometimes not mom and dad. Hello, Lois. And Karen Carlson. And Christina Williams. And 
So many ladies that serve in our children's ministry. Hello, Paul Bartlett, who is loving on some young men Friday on a trail. Hello, you know, right? I mean, I mean, sometimes we need others in the church. How many of our stories who have been in the church for years have that older person as a part of that story that took time and energy and invested into the life? You miss out on that. If you sit and say, man, Sunday morning is it. We are protecting and shielding our family from overcommitment by not engaging in the life of the church outside of Sunday morning. Now, that's one end, right? There's another end of the message that preaches that you've got to be at everything. Seven nights a week, seven days a week. We want you at everything. We're going to do all the things because we're going to separate ourselves from the things of this world and we are going to build a bubble that is called the church and we're not going to get outside of that bubble but we are going to have activities for all of your, for all of your family members to come to every day of the week so that you can be fulfilled and equipped only and completely within the confines and the safety of the body of Christ. Not biblical. Not biblical. Not biblical. I mean, Jesus Himself says, go be salt and light to the world. Let your light shine. So, mm, mm, mm. so let's keep going. Alright, you got it? You got it? So they devoted themselves to the teaching. And the teaching of God's Word and only God's Word. And so we have a responsibility as we devote ourselves as Summit Church to the Word of God within the mission of the church that we have a responsibility to make sure that we stick to it. Come on. Number two, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. Okay? We're going to move a little faster. All right? The fellowship, the koinonia is the word there. The church, the participation, and the sharing, including the sharing of material goods. The early church we see was marked by generosity, that they devoted themselves to the fellowship, to the fellowship. And again, that's what we just talked about, engaging in the life of the church outside of Sunday morning, that they devoted themselves to that. One of, one of the expressions of that is the third thing that they devoted themselves to, the breaking of bread. Now, this likely covers two things, communion, the, the, the elements that we share in from time to time when we have the Lord's Supper, communion, but also a, a, a larger fellowship meal, the pilux that they would have had back in Acts chapter 2 with the crock pots and all of that. Some of you caught that. Thank you very much. The breaking of bread. And again, and again, all this demonstrates all that Dr. Luke is trying to get the early church to see and the church of 2022 to see today by his writing and his reporting is that they did life together. They did life together. Now let me tell you why some of us struggle to do life together. Some of us struggle to do life together because we know how to do life really, really, really well. And if we do it together, other people are going to slow us down. Come on. Right? If I'm building something, if I'm building something and I want to get it done in a timely manner, and Ezra comes in and grabs a hammer or a screwdriver or Micah or, or, or you know, any of my kids and they want to help me and I want to get it done in a timely manner, what's the response? No! Don't help. Why? Because them helping and contributing will no doubt slow down the process. Right? Come on. Come on, y'all. Come on. You know I'm not the only bad father up here. Okay? I didn't hear that, but that's okay. We're going to keep going. Okay. Right? And so it slows down the process sometimes when we do things together. But what Dr. Luke is trying to get things to see is that, and we're going to see in just a moment, that life is so much more fulfilling and completing and the mission is accomplished so much 
further when we do life together. When we do life together. We were camping uh, last week as a family. And uh, because of the way it worked out, um, me and three of the kids went to the campsite earlier and Kristen and one of the kids came up about six hours later. So you know what that means? Kristen missed out on the joy (laughs) of setting up the campsite. We only called her like three or four times to figure out how to do things and where we should put things. Right? But she missed out on the joy. And so me and three of the kids, we set up our campsite. We fought with the awning, right? which is what you do when you're camping. And, and, and then we got to the point, every camper's dream. I know some of you in here don't camp, and I, I, I'm praying for you. right? But every camper's dream is when you get to the point where the campsite is set up and you sit in your chair. Oh. And you gaze at your work. <laughs> now, we showed up at the campsite at about 1.30. This finally happened for me at 5.30. Four hours later, I sit and gaze. It's beautiful. When you've built something, Right? Some of, you, some of you build cars, you work on cars, some of you build houses, some of you, so, some of, some of you enjoy you know, all these different things. And when you, when you get artists, right? when, you, when, you build, when you've built that thing and you get to sit back and enjoy the fruit of your labor. Dr. Luke is saying, that's so much better together. And so as I sat there and gazed, I called all the kids off the playground and away from their activities and made them sit in their chairs and gaze at the campsite. And we got about five seconds of gazing before they were like, nah, forget this. Like, I'm going back to the playground, right? They'll get it one day, Jen, right? But, but you get the point. What Dr. Luke is trying to see, get the church to see, is that this is better together. So they devoted themselves to the teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and then what we talked about last Sunday, the prayers. My house is to be a house of prayer. And so we see that in verse 42, right? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. And then in verses 43 through 47, he gets to the why. And we're going to do this very quickly. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So what did this devotion lead to for them? Because, because here's, the, here's the point. Some of the church, I don't want you to devote these things. I don't want you to devote yourself, your family to these things here at Summit Church or any church for that matter for our good Only. I mean, there's a beauty that comes when your family is devoted to Summit Church and we get to do these things for the glory of Summit Church. I mean, I mean, I mean, excuse me, for the glory of God in and through Summit Church. Let me say that correctly, okay? Right? There's a beauty that comes with that. But there's also a beauty that manifests itself in your life from God the Father when you devote yourself to these things. And I want you to see what that is. Number one, it led to a life of awe. It led to a life of awe. I mentioned I went hiking Friday morning. It was beautiful. And, 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 and went up Pleasant Mountain out in Bridgeton. Went on the Ledges Trail. If you haven't done it, it's beautiful. And, and there's a place about a mile up, maybe a mile and a quarter, where you get to, you get to just kind of walk along the cliff of this mountain and look out into northern Maine and Bridgeton and beyond. And you just get to, you get to see all these other hills that are out there and the, and the waves. And, 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 and I just... 
I said to, 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 to the people I was hiking with, I said, you can't look at this and tell me there wasn't a designer. You, you just can't. That there wasn't somebody that just, and, and I always said, I shared this with them on Friday, and I'll share it with you this morning. Being from North Carolina, seeing West and all of that, I am convinced that when God got to New England, and maybe he started in New England and just didn't take the time with other places, I don't know. I'll ask him when I get there, all right? But I am convinced that when it came to New England, God just flexed a little bit. He showed off for those of you who don't get the flexing reference, okay? That he showed off with New England. The beauty, the green. I was just talking to somebody that, 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 that lived for the last year or so in Colorado, and they said, you know what we missed? I mean, Colorado's beautiful. I don't know if you've ever been out to Colorado, but Pikes Peak and, and all of that, right? They lived right in Colorado Springs, so they gazed at Pikes Peak every day, right? Beautiful, beautiful scenery. But, it, but they said, you know, you know what we missed? I'm like, what'd you miss? Trees! And I'm like, whoa! I didn't even think about that. They were like, it's so brown all the time. And I'm like, yeah, we have all the amazingness, not only the ocean, because Colorado's landlocked, duh, right? But anyway, we have all the amazingness, and I'm not saying there's not other beautiful parts of the country, but I just believe, especially walking Friday morning up that trail, that God just showed off when it came to New England, right? And as I sat there on the trail, Looking, I was in awe. This devotion, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers, it led to an awe in them. My question for you when it comes to awe is when's the last time that you were awed by God? Because here's the reality for so many of us today, we are so busy with our lives that we don't take the time to stop and be awed by God. Awed through the love and affection of a loved one, awed by His creation, awed by His grace towards you and Jesus that you could be saved. I mean, I mean, just living in awe. When is the last time that you just sat back, whatever it is, and were awed by your Creator, by the lover of your soul? A second thing that it led to for them, the second why, the second fruit, is unity. Look at verses 44 and 45 again. And all who believed, everybody say all, Okay, very good. This section is stepping it up. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. You know what this tells me? I mean, not only, not only the unity that came from being devoted to the church together, but they were aware of needs. They, they were aware of needs. They were in tune with the needs of their people. They were in tune with the happenings of the families around them. They were in tune with the needs. They knew when, when so-and-so needed a new couch or a new dishwasher or a new fridge. They, they knew when, when, when someone's family was going through something and there may need to be some extra meals provided. They knew. Why? Because they were devoted to each other. Their devotion to God was so intense that it overflowed into a devotion to each other that they were aware of the needs and they made sure that as the church, as the body of Christ, they did anything possible to meet the need. To meet the need. Now, I'm going to out some of you. I'm not going to mention names. But there are some of you, when there's a need that arises and you see us coming to no doubt ask you about that need, you turn and not run, sprint in the other direction. Right? I mean, some of you have actually said when it comes to helping others move, take my number out of your phone. Right? And I know you were half joking. 
But I'm convinced that one of the reasons that we're missing out on the goodness of what the body of Christ was intended and created to be was because, is, because, is because that we are more devoted to ourselves than we are the things of God. That we are more devoted to our comforts than we are the needs of one another. And I believe that right there and the unity that we see here in Scripture is the thing that rubs the American church so deeply today because we don't know what it looks like to have devotion when it hurts. We don't understand what it looks like to be committed when it's hard. Because devotion and commitment are only found in making sure that our needs are met and we are comfortable. Lastly, we see that their devotion led to a fruitful favor. Now, this is the one thing. Whew. I am just constantly reminded of the favor of God on Summit Church. Come on. Whew. Constantly reminded. I mean, before we complain about no AC here this summer, let me remind you, we are here rent-free. Let me remind you that we are here this morning at 8.30 because the school is letting us keep everything set up this summer. And let me remind you, at SoGo last summer, it was way hotter than this in that basement. And sticky, slippery, because the floor was so wet. We were like sliding, right? Not even intending to. And I'm not, I'm just saying, let's count our blessings and the favor of God. Amen? But not only for the entire body of Christ, but they were seeing fruitful favor that numbers were being added to their... souls were being added to their number day by day. Day by day. Day. Now, it gets a little sticky sometimes. It's kind of like talking about money. It gets a little sticky sometimes when the pastor brings up numbers, okay? Because especially if you're new or recent with us, if you haven't been around the church in a while, right? Okay, the church is after my money, and they're just all about numbers, right? Well, kind of. Because the Bible teaches a lot and gives a lot of instruction about money, how to spend your money, and how to support those that serve and, and, and all of those things. And the Bible teaches a lot about growing. I mean, here we've seen it like two or three times just in the short passages that we're reading today that the church grew. 3,000 were added to their number. Souls were being added daily. Numbers were being added daily. And here's the thing that, that I like to say about numbers. Um, every number has a name. Every name has a story, and every story matters to God. And so before we get critical and say, oh, the church is just about growing their numbers, well, yeah, why? Because we want you in heaven. Regardless of where you worship on Sunday morning, as long as they worship Jesus and, and, and are devoted to the, to, to the Word, if you, if you transition out of Summit Church and go worship at, at, at somewhere else on Sunday morning, that's all good in the hood with me. I just want to see you when it really matters. Eternity. They see fruitful favor. The worship team is going to come. And I'm going to close with this. I'm going to turn to John 14, 4. If you have your Bible and you want to turn there, you can, but I'm just going to read it and we're going to pray. Some of us operate by this. I, I saw this on a t shirt or something. Maybe, I don't, I don't remember where I saw it, but I saw this somewhere out and about. 
never waste your feelings on people who don't value them. And at first, it's like, oh, wow, that's... Never waste your feelings on people who don't value them. And then as I kind of continued walking and processing and thinking on that saying, never waste your feelings on people who don't value them, I thought to myself, man, I am so glad that Jesus doesn't operate that way. Because we, we've sung and talked about the love of Jesus for us this morning. And I can, I can tell you, I can tell you in the last 24 hours that there have been moments where I haven't valued the love of Jesus in my life. Where that has not been the thing at the forefront of my mind. They made my coffee wrong this morning. The first thing on my mind walking out of that coffee place was not the love of Jesus in my life. It's not waste if you're doing it for the Lord. You may be serving a physical person in front of you. But if they don't value what you're doing, and that bothers you, then you're doing it for the wrong audience. See, it used to bother me all the time when I didn't feel valued and appreciated as a pastor. People would just walk out. People could so easily send emails and text messages about how they didn't like what I said. And they used to really bug me and eat at me deeply. Until one day I realized if I lose sleep over that, am I doing it for the right audience? As I preach to you this morning, am I preaching for the glory of God or so that you'll like me. I want both. But the former is far more important. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. I want to read this and we're going to sing. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I'm going. This is the hope of the church. There is nothing more valuable there is nothing more powerful and there's nothing more exciting than a church, a body of people, a koinonia, a gathering that is devoted to the things of God as God intended them to be. Nothing. There's nothing more thrilling than this. We're entering a time, we're going to talk about it in just a minute, we're entering a time where if God doesn't move, if God doesn't show up, If we're not in tune with what God is doing, we're going to be in trouble. We'll be having church in my backyard. But we believe so deeply that God is leading us. That we're about to see amazing things together. We're about to walk, we're about to watch God shut the mouths of lions. We're about to watch God provide. And, and, and here's the thing in that, is my hope and prayer is not the financial piece of that. That's fine. We've got people in our church that worry about that. I can't wait to see the souls 
that are going to be turned to heaven as a result of what God's about to do in and through our church. If we devote ourselves to the things of Him and to each other and to the breaking of bread and to the prayers, I can't wait to see what God's about to do in the lives of people around us as a result of what He's going to do physically with some concrete. Like, that's awesome. But here's the thing. That's our devotion in check. What are you devoted to? Are you devoted to comfort and a good time? Or are you devoted to life? Because my fear is that if we're devoted to comfort and a good time as Summit Church, we're not going to make it together. We're going to rub each other the wrong way. You're going to want time with me that I can't give you all the time which really bugs me to say. But you're at least like eighth in line of my time. And I love you. But we're going to rub each other the wrong way. Can we devote ourselves to the things that matter? And realize that every single person in this room has just as much value as I do. If not more. Y'all can find another pastor. Easily. There's great ones out there. I'm shocked that you still have me. But if we lose this, man, we lose it all. If we lose this, there's no reason to gather. Let's devote ourselves to the right things. God, thank you for your word, how timely it is. And I pray that you stir in us a passion to devote ourselves to the things that matter. In Jesus' name we pray.